Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, a 27-year veteran of the NYPD. Folks, the more we look into this case, the more you just surrender and say, my God, what the hell was going on here? And now we just hear uh, that there she is, Tiffany Adams, grandma, as she apparently hates to be called, granny, that granny confessed when she was arrested. They say she, she made statements, but statements implicating herself as being the killer, that's called a confession, you know? So court documents reveal that Tiffany Adams confessed to Kansas mom's murders. But again, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, the Kansas police, the FBI, no one's talking. No one's confirming the cause of death. Right now, of course, we, as we spoke ad nauseum, we have the manner of death, which is a homicide. But no one's talking cause of death. So we're going to look into this. And then, of course, look at all the premeditation, all the planning, all the other evidence they have. Because after all, there's four people under arrest right now, right? Four people are under arrest. And there could be more. There could be more to come. Right now, you're looking at these four individuals on the screen. There's grandma up at the top left, Tiffany Michelle Adams, Cole Earl Twombly, Tad Burt Cullum, and Cora Twombly. So we got four people under arrest. And for some of you folks not experienced in the criminal justice business or the law, all you have to do is do something to facilitate the crime. You don't have to pull the trigger. You don't have to actually do the murder. You have to just be a planner, an organizer, be at the scene, do something to help facilitate this crime. And guess what? In this case, you're being charged with murder in the first degree, kidnapping in the first degree, and conspiracy to commit murder. So all of those things are going against you. You see these people up on the screen. Here they are in happier times. Uh, Mr. Twombly there and uh, Cole Earl Twombly and Cora Twombly, the couple there, that uh, the couple that stays together, stays in prison together, you know, commits murder together or conspires to commit murder together. God's misfits, you know, here they are on the screen and here they are in their perp attire, as we would call it in the NYPD. So we're going to look into this and also look into the case as for the premeditation, the conspiracy. And this town, too, this area, it seems that there's a lot going on in this area. And there's another person's name who was mentioned, but yet we don't hear about him right now. He's mentioned in the arrest affidavit, Paul Grice. Where is he right now? Did he flee the jurisdiction? How come he's not under arrest? That's what we would like to know. Is he the fifth and that he just... What didn't get caught the day they went out to arrest all these people? So, folks, hold on to your seats. Hold on to your hats. You're about to enter true crime from a police perspective. You're about to enter the off-the-cuff zone, the police off-the-cuff zone. There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir. They have the car stopped in Tampa and Grant, Michael Biden. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. Joining me today is going to be retired NYPD sergeant, professor at Albertus Magnus College in Connecticut. He's taking a, an administrative day where he does all his paperwork today so he could appear on this show. So welcome to the show, Professor Mike Geary. Welcome, Mike. Hey, Billy. Good to see you, and thank you for having me on, and welcome, everyone. Welcome. You know, Mike, when we hear, uh, and it's one TV station came on, uh, KSN TV came on and said, 
there are court documents that reveal that she admitted uh, responsibility for the death of the missing Can uh, Kansas women. Of course, we, as we know, Veronica uh, Butler and Jillian Kelly. What do you think about that, Mike? Billy, I think uh, we talked about this earlier this morning. I think that probably um, when the SWAT team, this is my guess, when the SWAT team came in, that there may have been some spontaneous statements made uh, in, utter, you know, uttering spontaneous statements, which are perfectly allowable. And I think she made them to law enforcement. She obviously would not make those statements if she was in custodial interrogation and had an attorney present. So at that point, I'm thinking early on, at that point, when they when they came in, she may may have made some sort of uh, spontaneous statements, maybe to try to clear um, her uh, boyfriend, um, uh, uh, Bert, uh, Tad, Bert Cullum. So I'm thinking something like that. Now, that would be obviously, as you and Phil know, would be now in the investigator's case file that eventually will be turned over in discovery, um, you know, uh, in the future as we go forward towards a trial. But um, yeah, I think those those were spontaneous statements made uh, to police in, in a very excited state. And um, that is really useful information and provides a real clear picture, probably with just those few statements about what happened, the inside, <clears throat> sorry, the inside facts of what actually happened to those poor ladies. You know, Mike, early, very early on in this investigation, before the victims were found, this was posted on Facebook by Jillian mm -hmm. Kelly's mother. Mm -hmm. Jillian has passed away. And here was the second post. The grandma has confessed to killing them both. So perhaps the police told the families and they said, please keep it to yourself. But we owe you the respect yeah. of letting you know so you don't hear it from the press if it leaks out somewhere. However... The mother of uh, Jillian Kelly felt the need to post this on Facebook. Jillian has passed away, and the grandma has confessed to killing both. So we mentioned that early on, but we couldn't go with it as a gospel look because it wasn't confirmation. And who do we? How do we know if that was in fact the mother of Jillian Kelly posting that on Facebook? But this is three KSN TV posting this, and I believe this was last night. So I'm going to play this for you right here. We thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Jeff Herndon. New developments in the case of the murdered Southwest Kansas mothers. Court documents reveal Tiffany Adams, the grandmother of Veronica Butler's children, admitted to killing Veronica and Jillian Kelly in the state's motion to hold Adams and the three other suspects without bond. Investigators wrote, after Adams was arrested, she, quote, made statements to law enforcement indicating she was responsible for the deaths of Butler and Kelly. The documents do not reveal what those statements entailed. Adams, Tad Colum, and Cole and Cora Twombly were in court for their first appearance today. They are each charged with first-degree murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy. A judge denied all of them bond. It's something prosecutors pushed for. In court documents, they said, quote, now faced with the consequences of a sentence of death or life in prison, the defendants would be willing to do anything since they have shown to be willing to commit capital murder in order to limit Veronica's visitation. Prosecutors say there were many attempts made to take Veronica's life. Other court documents show the years of turmoil between Veronica and Tiffany, but efforts to secure a protection order did not get approved by a judge. Do you feel like the justice system failed? Veronica? They 100%. Has it always been like this with Tiffany? In the last five years, 100%, they have failed. What would you say to the justice system? They don't want to know. I don't have to get off your start. <laughs> well, the maximum sentence for murder is death, life or life without parole. Julia Thatcher asked the district attorney if the death penalty is on the table. He told her that will be decided later. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Jeff Herndon. New Let me pull it off here. Uh, so, according to that, that now court documents, of course, no one is producing the court documents right now, but an in custody yeah. interrogation is, means after Miranda. Right. So, oh, she was issued Miranda. Yes, yeah, she was <laughs> issued yeah. Miranda and she confessed. So, yeah. but, you know, that doesn't help any of the other defendants because they're all conspirators, co-conspirators. And as we, we um, try to explain, 
the littlest involvement when you're a co-conspirator, you can still get the death penalty. Because what you did facilitated this murder in the first degree, this kidnapping first degree, this conspiracy. So they are all equally eligible for the death penalty. Your thoughts, Mike? Yeah, Billy, I, I'm glad that the, um, that the statements, now that I saw that video clip, I'm glad the statements were made after Miranda had been given because that makes it more absolutely airtight that that will be accepted by the judge and no one can then say, uh, oh, she made a spontaneous statement without an attorney present. So I'm actually glad that I was wrong because that is actually so much better that she made it during a custodial interrogation. That's fantastic. And you know what? Like you said, it doesn't matter if her her um, if Bert just picked up a shovel and threw it in the back of a truck and said, let's go. Or he was a passenger or he decided to go get the cell phones for her at Walmart or uh, the burner phones or maybe a stun gun. Any little objective you know, action that is taken in furtherance of a crime, either before it happens during the crime or afterwards to try to conceal the crime makes that person a co-conspirator. And as you pointed out, a co-conspirator is equally, equally under the law, responsible as if they were the one who actually pulled the trigger. So no matter what um, Granny wanted to do, perhaps to try to save someone or, or whatever, um, take a little bit of extra blame on herself. The fact is they are all equally guilty. 100%. And one of the things that we realize, and we'll go to it later on, uh, the arrest affidavit, is all the planning that went into this oh, yeah. and all the details and all the premeditation. And we'll take a look at that. But I wanted to play this. Was, this was interesting. It was on Cuomo, a former attorney of uh, Tiffany Adams, speaks about her uh, in this interview with uh, Cuomo. Yeah, she was charged. When you look through the documents, counsel, and the recitation of what happened from the 16-year-old witness uh, specifically, it is a pretty compelling narrative that your client was absolutely involved in this and it was planned. How do you understand that? Well, <clears throat> to be fair, um, this has been a contentious custody uh, and guardianship matter. And a lot of temporary orders have been entered by the court, but no final orders it, it, having been entered. It's gone on too long and it's too acrimoniously. Now, and the, 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 uh, Ms. Adams is a well-known member of the community. Uh, and she's in the farming and ranching business. Her family is a fine years. She's on the board of the county hospital. Uh, and she's a farmer rancher. Uh, she has strong feelings. The children's uh, mother and father were never married, so we have this custody battle. The father is serving at a time in prison, so he's not available. And she asked the court in a petition for guardianship to be made the guardian of the children, right. in other words, custody. Now, what brought this on was the issue of temporary visitation and whether it would be uh, supervised or unsupervised. Yes. Right. But and I get I get all that. And I get that it was ugly counsel. What I'm saying is, did you ever get any indication that your client was willing, desperate enough to do anything violent to the mother just to keep custody of the kids? I did not. When you heard that, you know, you say she's a member of the community, she's well known. Did you know that she was a part of an organization called God's Misfits that's uh, supposedly this kind of anarchic organization that's anti-government, anti-rules? I did not know that, but I'm not surprised. A Cimarron County <clears throat> and much of the Panhandle is very uh, individualistic, independent, um, mostly uh, farmers and uh, town suppliers, and very, very conservative. And I've represented people in the panhandle over 50 years, 
And I, every time I go out there, I hear about a new group that doesn't believe in, in your dollar bill or other things. And that just goes on in Cimarron County. It's a small, isolated county, mm. looks to Amarillo, shops Amarillo, watches Amarillo television, and they keep to themselves. But since 1960, they have changed politically, um, it, very evangelical, very uh, conspiratorial in the sense of uh, <clears throat> not trusting the government. You know, Mike, it's amazing to me um, that attorneys who preach um, to keep your mouth shut go on television and spoof forth all kinds of uh, information about their client or their former client. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, very respectfully, I think he's talking out of his hat. Um, you know, he first started talking when Mr. Como first asked him a question. He started going on and on and on and on and on and on and wouldn't address the, the question. The big question about was there actually any indications previously that she was like a homicidal maniac, that she had the potential to, to kill. And he, you know, he then finally answered it. And then he goes on to about, about the politics and, and people's feelings, um, you know, about in, being independent. You know, um, he should have just respectfully declined the interview right from the start to say, Mr. Como, I cannot really speak about what uh, about my former client, especially in indicating to you any sort of issues that she may have had now that she has another attorney. You know, you should funnel all questions through that new attorney, that public defender, whoever, whomever is uh, representing her and say no more and just hang up the phone. Um, I, I can't stand it when defense, especially any any attorney can't keep uh, their thoughts to themselves. Not good. No. Uh, Eliza Krogan, I read the locals are really upset about this. So although independent and all, not all are murderers. No, this puts a big stain, of course, mm -hmm. on the community. And it looks them look like hillbillies. Right. That are just murderers. You know, that, that whole story about trying to throw an anvil through. I mean, that was like lunacy. I mean... <laughs> Oh, you know, anvils frequently fall off the back of work trucks. Let's make it look like that's what happened here. And uh, an anvil uh, fall through her windshield and kill her. Like, where did that come from? You know, we jokingly said it reminds us of the cartoon, The Roadrunner, who was always trying to get killed with an anvil. But just, uh, you know, this is baffling. So I want to just get back to the whole thing. So Granny, and again, some folks in the chat may be confused that think, we don't know who Granny is. Of course, we know who Granny is. Granny is uh, is Miss Adams, right? Is right. Tiffany Adams, not the, the the other female involved here. The woman on the left here is Tiffany Adams. And apparently, when you look at that photo, and we've been critical of how she looks, she's only 54 years old. She looks a hell of a lot older in that picture. But apparently, she's an affluent woman that owns a ton of land, is a leader in this community. But a hateful, scary individual now that we know is a double murderer, according to her confession. And again, she's innocent to proven guilty, because when I don't say that, people uh, attack me. She's innocent to proven guilty, but we still don't know the cause of death. We have an idea of the cause of death. It's probably gunshot. But in addition, on the scene, a weapon, a hammer, was found next to Veronica's glasses on the ground outside the vehicle. Could there also be blunt trauma? So that's being held back too. We're not being told the cause of death. We know the manner of death is murder, homicide. The cause, we're not being told that yet, Mike. Yeah, Billy, it may be a combination because when you see a bloody hammer and, and blood in the car and blood outside the car um, and broken, broken eyeglasses, you know she was struck in the face, in the head, you know, probably numerous times. Um, if that didn't kill her, they had the stun guns ready. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if they also shot, you know, the bodies at the end when they dumped them in the in the uh, that the little culvert that they that had they uh, dug out. But uh, yeah, there may be multiple, um, you know, uh, causes of death. So it might be blunt trauma and shooting, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, this was a, a, a vicious attack. I mean, anybody that would plan to throw an anvil off a road overpass so that when the car when 
you know, uh, her car was driving underneath it in order to try to get that anvil through the front windshield uh, and cause a fatal car accident or just kill her outright with the anvil. Um, that's concentrated evil. And so I would imagine the anger um, at, at, and the ability to have um, your way with someone who's already been maybe beaten um, would bring out the worst. And I think probably there was a savage attack on these women and they their deaths were not you know, uh, quick and merciful. No, they were probably suffered tremendously. And I hope we get to the bottom of it. And I hope the, uh, there's enough evidence that the, uh, you know, the district attorney and the, um, the medical examiner can figure out exactly, you know, what the cause or causes of death were, because, um, this, this kind of case with these two innocent girls, this calls out for justice. Absolutely. Pim from the chat. Adams is no longer considered an outstanding member of the community after this. She fooled the whole community as to what kind of person she really is. Many wealthy people have committed murder. Pim, yeah, I, I don't think she's going to go back to her former status if she was a revered member of the community. Phoebe, they said that it was a homicide and immortal wounds. Phoebe, I've never heard the term immortal wounds. Mortal, yes. I've never heard immortal uh, wounds. That could be a mistake uh, in language. Uh well, the kids right there when their mother was murdered, Dorothy uh, Miller, no, they were not. They were staying with other people. Uh, Sharon Lane from the chat, Granny is a vigilante gang leader. Yeah, uh, hmm. God's misfits, apparently. And uh, many people, uh, DG, uh, yeah, broken hammer was found on the scene, which could in be indicative of blunt trauma, right? Uh, Annabelle... Roma, she confessed. So what's next? There won't be a trial. For, no, no, no. There will be a trial, Annabelle, because what will happen next is her defense attorney will try to get the confession thrown out. That's the next step. They will try to minute. They'll say the police coerced her. They'll say the police threatened her. They'll say she didn't understand her rights. They didn't read a Miranda. They'll come up with a bunch of reasons why the confession will be thrown out. No, she will still go to trial because... This is a death penalty case. The only way she wouldn't go to trial, and I've never heard of anyone confess in a death penalty case because it's just like throwing yourself on the sword. So no, she will definitely take this to trial. But the confession, you don't just take a confession as someone's word. You now match the confession up to the evidence. So if she says, I shot uh, so-and-so twice and I shot so-and-so once. I shot her in the head. I shot her in the chest. You match up the evidence, the confession to the evidence, and that makes the evidence that much more powerful. Mike? Yeah, Billy, um, every single person facing really serious charges like this are, and have made um, unwisely made incriminating statements, once the attorney gets in the picture, they will always make a motion to exclude the uh, that evidence at trial. Uh, it happens all the time. Um, even if the police have her signing a, uh, a Miranda statement after they read it to her, probably on videotape and had her sign it and it was entered into a log book, you know, and that actually piece of paper actually becomes part of the uh, case file. They will still try to say she didn't understand, even though she speaks English and she lived in this country. And, you know, people say all kinds of things in order to try to get their statements thrown out because they realize later on after the attorney talks to them how unwise it was for them to make those statements but you know what i believe in this kind of case with so many jurisdictions uh, so many agencies they did everything according to the book according to you know what the requirements were they dotted every i crossed every t this is not a kind of case where they would do something haphazard and foolish they these were professionals and they did everything right so People can say whatever they want that, oh, oh, I didn't, I never said those words. Uh, I don't think it's going to go very far, especially as you say, once you can take those, those, uh, that, those statements and you corroborate them with physical evidence, then, you know, it shows the actual truthfulness and the reliability and the accuracy of those statements at trial. So Absolutely. I think she's cooked. Legal-minded friends, Karen Cole asks, what is an anvil? <laughs> an anvil <laughs> is a huge piece of steel that has two arms at the end. It probably weighs 150 to 200 pounds. 
and it's used by blacksmiths or people that use me that do metal work to hammer and shape things uh, using the hammer to hit against the anvil and the object so they can bend them into the I mean, that's the best as I could describe it. Mike, you describe it any better than that? No, it's just a big, huge, solid chunk of some sort of iron or steel that, yeah, blacksmiths bang metal against it to shape horseshoes and, and whatever else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, uh, here's, it's here's two little, it's two city boys trying to, <laughs> what an is, you know? uh, trying to describe that. I want to read, I want to read a little bit taken right from the arrest affidavit, uh, I recently someone sent me a, a good copy. The copy I had was horrible, and now this this is the the, be, the best I've seen so far. But it's still not perfect, and it may not be. Uh, let's see. Um, interviews were conducted relative to the disappearance. It was discovered that Butler was in a problematic custody battle with Tiffany Adams for the custody of Butler's two children. The father of those children was Wrangler Rickman, Adams' son. Butler's visitation with her children was court-ordered to be supervised every Saturday. Adams had a particular person she preferred to supervise those visitations, and that was Cheryl Bruin. The court ordered Adams to pay Bruin to supervise visits if that was who she wanted to be present. Otherwise, Butler was to choose and pay for the person to supervise. Adams said Bruin was unavailable to supervise the visitation on March 30th, 2024. So Butler was required to arrange the supervision with one of her three approved individuals. Butler contacted Kelly of Yugaton, Kansas, and planned to have her supervise the visit. Now, there's another thing right there. Uh, Brune is now an outstanding witness because was she told not to show up by Adams because she, Adams didn't want to kill Brune, but she would happily kill the person that Veronica chose to be her supervisor. I mean, which is a little bit crazy because she really doesn't know Kelly either. You know, she doesn't know her, but she was happy to kill her. But she didn't want to kill uh, Cheryl Bruin. So she should take a couple of weeks off. I mean, that to me is, is pretty crazy, right? Uh, Butler told family members she was going to pick up her children from Adam's at 10 hundred hours or 10 a.m. at Four Corners intersection of Highway 95 and U.S. 64 West, a location in Texas County, Oklahoma. Butler and Kelly left Yugaton, Kansas and traveled to Highway 95 and rode L five miles north of Four Corners. Butler and Kelly arrived at the location at approximately 9.40 a.m. Butler planned to bring her daughter to a birthday party, but after they did not arrive, the family began looking for Butler. So the family was raised up right away. They knew something was bad. Uh, Melissa and Joey Padilla, who were Butler's family members, located Butler's abandoned vehicle just west of intersection of Highway 95 and Road L. The Padillas then contacted law enforcement at 12.09 hours. An examination of the vehicle and area surrounding the vehicle found evidence of a severe injury. Blood was found on the roadway and the edge of the roadway. Butler's glasses were also found in the roadway south of the vehicle near a broken hammer. A pistol magazine was found inside Kelly's purse at the scene, but no pistol was found. Adams told OSBI that on Friday night, March 29th, Rickman and Butler's children stayed the night with Barrett and Lacey Cook. So again, premeditation. She's finding a place for the kids to stay because she knows she's going on this dirty mission the next day. Adam said she planned to pick them up that morning before visitation. Adam said she called Butler at 9 a.m. to confirm the meeting. And Butler told Adam something came up and she was not going to make it. Butler's phone records confirmed the call occurred. However, at the time of the call, Butler was in Yucatan, Kansas, in the process of picking Kelly up to go meet Adams. Adams stated she was home at the time that Butler and Kelly went missing. Adams picked the children up before 12, uh, 12 p.m. from the Cook's residence. OSBI interviewed Bruin and said she was available to supervise the visit that day, but Adams told her to take a couple of weeks off from visitation so Adams could question the children 
related to how Butler's approved visitation supervisors were. So, Mike, all of this, again, premeditation. She's setting up this confrontation. She's setting up this horrible thing that is about to happen. And she's planned it with others. Your thoughts? Yeah, Billy, the the uh, the phone conversation with Miss Bruin, you know, about taking time off, things like that, and talking to, um, you know, um, Veronica and uh, Veronica, you know, she, I'm thinking perhaps Granny, um, you know, may not have realized that once she told Ms. Bruin to take some time off, I'm thinking perhaps, I'm not sure, but perhaps she thought Veronica would come by herself and not get Kelly uh, to come with her. But probably she did that to make sure that, um, that, uh, Kel that she felt a little bit more comfortable having a witness, you know, to see how it is dealing with Granny. So I'm thinking maybe Granny did not know that um, that there would be another per person like Kelly in the car and just thought maybe Butler would just come by herself so that she would only have to kill one and dispose of one body. Um, and so maybe that was a little twist that she wasn't expecting. And, you know, if you go to kill one person, you can't have a living witness right next, right, sitting right there. They have to die, too. And um, I think uh, uh, it, Granny was quoted as telling, um, I, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Cole was, uh, um, so, oh, no, I'm sorry, um, the Tubley, Ms. Tubley, Cora Twobly said to her daughter that, uh, you know, the, the second lady had to die because she was on um, Ms. Butler's side. She wasn't innocent. She was guilty of trying to take the children away. So yeah, there with the phones and the phone conversations with several people trying, I'm thinking to try to isolate uh, Ms. Butler. And, uh, and and then once you're talking to somebody, you can kind of figure out maybe where they are. So you know how much time you have for them to get, you know, the, the 40 or 50 miles, of third, whatever it is to get to where the children are. Uh, tremendous amount of all little steps in order to try to bring about this case, um, you know, the, the murder. So therefore, this this speaks volumes about uh, premeditation. This was not an act uh, of violence that was brought on by a, a sudden confrontation or sudden uh, in the heat of passion, you know, where there was some sort of, you know, you know, words said in the heat of in the heat of, of a moment within of family members. No, this was an absolute cold, dark, uh, premeditated slaughter of innocent of an innocent woman and uh, a two innocent women, uh, all for um, winning a custody battle. That is the definition of evil. Absolutely. Kevin Callahan, no chance other three walk away, Professor Michael, with a confession out. No, we've, just, no. we've explained that. There's premeditation. You do the littlest <clears throat> thing to facilitate a felony, you're in. You're in the bag. You're, yeah. you're getting arrested for the same thing. Look, I've had murders where the only actions a person did was they were the driver. They were the getaway driver. They got 25 to life after conviction of the murderer. So, you know, use your head. Uh, the littlest thing you do, they can get you for acting in concert, criminal facilitation, criminal conspiracy, kidnapping, murder first degree. No, they will not get out because she confessed to it. Mike. Yeah, it's a great question. But even if by some really weird chance, the uh, confession gets thrown out. You've got other statements by other people that the grandmother had contacted. So you can kind of figure out where people were independent of that confession. You've got um, the Twobly 16 year old daughter making statements. So yeah, even if say it happens, um, the uh, um, confession is thrown out. There is so much overwhelming electronic uh, you know, phone data evidence and other statements made by other people placing, you know, people in a certain area. You've got the phones, uh, the, the burner phones all co uh, joining in at that field. You've got them being then turned off in unison. You've got the uh, you've got the uh, phones from Miss um, Butler, Miss Kelly going silent right around 945. You know, you've got all of these connections and you've got all the circumstantial evidence. Yeah, I don't think you have to worry about, about, about that confession. Even if it did get thrown out, don't worry. They are not walking anytime soon. 
no, no. 100%. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff, real crime stories. If you like real crime, true crime from a police perspective, you're in the right place. And if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, ring that bell, hit the like button, share us with your friends or your family. If you want to contribute to us financially, we have a Patreon with three different levels. We also have a YouTube channel membership with Countem, five different levels, and our channel is growing by leaps and bounds. And even though someone said the other day, which we found quite amusing when we had Bobby Chacon on with us, retired FBI agent, he says, you guys are three washed up cops. <laughs> we found that to be tremendously humorous because when you look at a lot of people on YouTube, I don't want to criticize them, but we actually have credentials, you know, both Bobby Chacon is a lawyer, a scuba expert, FBI agent. Mike Geary is a professor, criminal justice lawyer, retired NYPD sergeant. I'm a retired NYPD sergeant, 27 years, criminal justice professor. You know, we don't have to rail on about our credentials, but we found it funny when someone said we're three washed up cops. So we do have a sense of humor, even though that was uh, that was off the charts. I want to go back to the arrest aff affidavit right now. Uh, Butler, uh, excuse me, um, we're talking about the, the phone call they had between uh, – Butler and, and, and Kelly's phone records indicated the devices were actively sending signals to their carriers until approximately 0942 hours after which the devices were no longer seen by the networks and stopped transmitting. Neither phone was found at the scene or within the vehicle. And they are currently missing. Adams was the last known person to communicate with Butler and was scheduled to meet Butler and Kelly for visit visitation at 10 hours. 10 o'clock on March 30th, 2024. One of the things I would ask right away if I was an investigator in the interview uh, with Tiffany Adams was, where are their phones? And what if she's confessing, why wouldn't she cooperate? Well, we took their phones and we did this to them. So if they can then retrieve those phones from where the conspirators, the other people dump them, that's a huge, huge piece of evidence. And I don't doubt that the investigators asked that because it's very important. Mike. Off at around off the network and they disappear around 940, 942, something like that. And we can and we can see them traveling, you know, past, um, you know, cell towers and suddenly they go they go dark and they're not recovered. You know, they had to be physically removed from those ladies and somewhere between that point where the, where that car was found with all the blood and where the bodies were eventually found, you know, you want to go through that area with some sort of, um, you, you know, a metal detectors, or whatever. It, you can hopefully narrow down the area. But if you can find them and then verify that, that you know, maybe they were destroyed by a hammer or whether they were just thrown in a ditch. You can you can show the path that the bodies were on and the and the parties taking the bodies to the to where they uh, dump them and bury them. You could show where that is. That is really excellent for a jury to see that because it's one more nail in the coffin of these people, and they will go to prison for either life or or get the death penalty. But that's one more thing the jury can look at. It's tangible. You see a broken cell phone and destroyed and dirty and filthy and you see it and you realize the person who had this phone was you know uh killed and their phone tossed aside in an attempt to uh thwart any sort of recovery or law enforcement efforts that is you know as a prosecutor you want that tangible piece of, of evidence that tangible item in the jury's hands so they can see it it makes the story that much more dramatic it makes the story that much more real so if they could get it that would be fantastic uh through the child custody case recordings were obtained where rickman who is the baby's daddy and also uh, adams's son discussed death threats by adams and adams boyfriend tad column so there we go with some more evidence coming forth the custody battle began in february of 2019 with many hearings and court appearances on March 18th, 2024 and March 20th, 2024, motions were filed requesting extended visitation for Butler. A hearing was scheduled to occur on April 17th. Butler's attorney informed OSBI that Butler was likely, likely to receive unsupervised visitation with the children at that hearing. At times, Adams refused to let Rickman have his children, even though Rickman had legal custody of them. 
Law enforcement previously responded to a call for service where Adams refused to give Rickman his children. Reportedly, the officer told Rickman he believed the children would be better off in Adams' care. That's neither here nor there. The law says he should have gotten the kids. Rickman's grandmother, Debbie Knox Davis, reported that in mid to late February 2024, Rickman told her they didn't have to worry about the custody battle much longer because Adams had it under control. That Adams knew the path the judge walked to work and we will take out Veronica at drop-off. Rickman was confirmed to be in rehabilitation in Oklahoma City uh, at the time of the appearance. The children remain in the custody of Adams. Rickman denied having that conversation with Knox. On April... Uh, 1st, 2024, OSBI agents obtained a search warrant, warrant for Adam's cellular phone. They performed an extraction on the device. Information gained from the device included web searches for taser pain level, gun shops, prepaid cellular phones, and, and how to get someone out of their house. The amazing thing, and we saw this on the Gilgo Beach case also, when it says they obtained a, obtained a search warrant and they performed an extraction, they don't even need to have the phone anymore. They just need to have the electronic address of the phone, and they can do this remotely. So the person that has the phone doesn't even know, or the computer for that matter also. In the Gilgo Beach case, they found all kinds of evidence on Rex Schumann's computer. He had no idea they had pulled all of the evidence off it. So law enforcement has these electronic, these digital capabilities. They're unbelievable. And some of the biggest ones... Uh, or from cell phones. Uh, information gained from the device included web searches for taser pain level, gun shops, prepaid cellular phones, and how to get someone out of their house. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, on April 3rd, and this is the smoking gun, on April 3rd, OSBI interviewed, should be known as the complaining witness, age 16 years old, complaining Witness is the daughter of Cora Twombly and Kobe White. Cora is the is married to Cole Twombly. So Cole is actually the stepfather. The complaining witness stated she had overheard group conversations related to Butler not protecting her children from her brother, all in reference to an essay uh, abuse allegation. Complainant witness advised that she was told by Cora that Adams, Cullum, Cora Cole, and Paul Grice were involved in the deaths of Butler and Kelly. Wow. Powerful evidence. She stated that Adams had provided burner phones to use so they could communicate without using their own personal devices. Complaining witness said two burner phones charging on Cora's nightstand in her bedroom. So she also sees the burner phones on their nightstand. The complaining witness described Cora Cole Adams' column Paul Grice as being part of an anti-government group that had a religious affiliation. Though AS, OSBI investigation was learned that they called their group God's Misfits. Regular meetings are held weekly at Twombly's in the home of Barrett and Lacey Cook. Uh, complainant witness was told on March 29th that Cora and Cole would not be home in the morning when she woke and were going to be on a mission. When the complaining witness awoke at approximately 10 o'clock, Cora and Cole were not home but came home around 12 o'clock. Complainant knew that Cole and Cora took a blue and gray Chevrolet pickup owned by them and a blue flatbed pickup owned by Clint Twombly. When they left and returned in the same vehicles, complainant witness was told to clean the interior of the Chevrolet pickup. Complainant witness asked Cora what had happened and was told that things did not go as planned, but that they would not have to worry about her, Butler, again. Complaining witness was told that Cora and Cole blocked the road to stop Butler and Kelly and divert them to where Adams, Cullum, and Grace were. Complaining witness asked about Kelly and why she had to die and was told by Cora that she wasn't innocent either as she had supported Butler. Complaining witness asked Cora if their bodies were put in a well and Cora replied, something like that. Complaining witness also disclosed that other attempts to kill Butler occurred during February. Uh, near Yucatan, Kansas, in which Adams, Cullum, Cole, Cora, and Grice went to Yucatan, but Butler did not leave her residence. This is consistent with the web search discovered on Adams' phone about how to get someone out of their house. According to Cora, the plan was to throw an anvil 
through Butler's windshield while driving make it look like an accident because anvils regularly fall off work vehicles. Mike, this is so unbelievable. Like, how do you plan to kill someone with an anvil? I mean, first of all, there's no way you could time it throwing it off a bridge. Uh, you'd have to just ha have the car there and, 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 and have it stopped and have someone. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But as we say all the time on this show, truth is stranger than fiction. Billy, it's it's so scary that people would actually think of dropping an anvil, deliberately dropping an anvil off some sort of overpass, knowing where uh, a direction a car would be traveling in and maybe what time they would be, that you could be that perfectly drop it. Um, that shows you um, a level of evil and a level of premeditation. And they kept trying. This wasn't like, you know, again, it wasn't a heat of passion thing. This was something where they wanted this poor lady dead all over custody dispute. And it's scary because it's funny and as ridiculous as it is. It sounds like the coyote trying to kill the roadrunner with an Acme, you know, built anvil and always end up hurting, them, hurting himself. Um, it shows a desperation, a real sick desperation to try to, you know, uh, gain custody for for the for Adams. And I just had a quick uh, comment about um, about um, Wrangler Rickman. Early on, somebody named Buki Moore, and then just recently, somebody named DG in the chat wants to know if he probably knew, and whether or not his uh, statement uh, that Knox's statement to him was actually accurate. It probably was accurate because it was spontaneous. And he probably knew, and he's absolutely uh, fortunate in terms of his legal implications that he was actually away from that area and in, in rehab at the time. If all he did was hand someone a set of keys or gas up a truck, that and then he could stay home and not witness it, that would make him a conspirator. So yeah, he probably 90, I would bet my paycheck, he knew and that he was glad he was far away from that that scene. And I'm pretty darn sure that the the his grandmother's statements uh, to him uh, would let him know what was in store for his uh, for his uh, two the mother of his two children. So he is to me, even if he's never charged, he is as evil as the four that have been charged. I agree, Mike. I just want to get through a little bit more of this because while in Carrick, Texas, interviewing complainant witness and her brother, Cora and Cole, the Twombly's, arrived and tried to get access to complainant witness and her brother. Cora was verbally aggressive and was very upset with your affiant that she was not granted access to complainant witness and her brother. Cole exited the vehicle armed with a handgun in a holster on his belt. OSBI investigation showed that Adams searched for gun shops on her cellular phone. A search of local gun shops showed Adams buying five stun guns at the Big R store in Goyman, Oklahoma. The purchase was, was made on March 23rd. OSBI investigation showed that Adams purchased three prepaid cellular phones from Walmart in Goyman, Oklahoma on February 13th. The phones were identified by phone numbers. I won't list all the phone numbers here. It's in the uh, search warrant affidavit. Search warrants for information related to location services and phone usage were completed for each device. It was learned that all three phones were at the area where Butler's car was located and the last known location of Butler and Kelly at the time of their disappearance. That's powerful, powerful evidence. All three phones were powered on and accessed the cellular network for the first time at or near Cullum's residence at different times prior to March 30th, 2024. On March 30th, phone numbers, they go over them uh, before um, before Butler and Kelly's disappearance were at Twombly's residence prior to going to or near Cullum's residence. Butler and Kelly's disappearance at 10.05 and 10.16 hours, and they give the phone numbers, they were in the area at or near Cullum's residence. So it's showing where these phones were mm -hmm. prior to and during the commission of these crimes. Powerful evidence, you know, and when people early on in this evidence says, oh, the phone, um, the phone uh, cell site information is going to be useless because it's so rural that the FBI has equipment that can 
blow you away. And they look at what this evidence, they, they know when the phones were powered on. How great is that, Mike? Billy, it's fantastic because it doesn't rely on a, on a witness and their memory. It's absolutely accurate, you know, because this is how you get billed. This is how things work. Um, and cell phones, people don't realize, I mean, they really are little GPS devices because they follow you. If they're in your pocket or in your car and you're driving around, the, the, the company or like the FBI will know exactly where you were uh, pretty much to probably within a half of a mile or a quarter of a mile. They can pretty much track down where you were at a particular time, what direction you were going in, whether you were talking to somebody at the same time as you were driving or walking. You know, it's tremendous information. It's really difficult to refute that information because we know it's accurate. Um, and uh, that and it doesn't have to be a passionate witness talking. It's cold, hard facts that are undeniable when you can when you could look at when a phone comes on when a phone goes off where does it travel what time does it travel who is using it to communicate with someone else it's fantastic and um, that is one of the most important pieces of information in this case because you can't deny that your phone didn't move around with you absolutely it's fantastic you know, mike i just want to read this last paragraph because it's like icing on the cake after Butler and Kelly's disappearance on March 30th between 1016 and 1035 hours, it was determined that phone numbers, which are two of the uh, um, the phones in question used by the perpetrators, the boost phones, uh, were at a property owned by Jamie Beasley below a dam in the pasture where fresh dirt work was located by your affiant. Concrete was moved from a location near Beasley's residence approximately 150 to 200 yards below the dam where it was discovered that a hole had been dug and filled back in and then covered with hay. The location where Butler and Kelly disappeared from and where Butler's vehicle was located is approximately eight and a half miles away from the location below the dam on Be Beasley's property, giving drive time from the location of where Butler's vehicle was located to Be Beasley's property, well within the 34 minutes between the time of Butler Kelly's phone stopping transmission and prepaid phone numbers, and they give the phone numbers, arriving at the dam on Beasley's property. All prepaid phones stopped transmitting on the morning of March 30th at locations near Twombly's residence and Beasley's property. And at the end of this, it lists the charges, murder in the first degree, kidnapping, and conspiracy. Powerful, powerful evidence, premeditation. The cell phone work is just, to me, is, is, is like a slam dunk. It's just so powerful. And when people doubt why they call the FBI in, there's the biggest reason right there in a case like this. The toys they have, the technology ha they have, the resources they have, the money they have to spend on an investigation like this, they're invaluable. They're absolutely invaluable, Mike. Yeah, you know, just think about it. You have the NYPD with all of its resources. You have, like, say, the Chicago PD, Miami PD, LA PD, you know, San Francisco PD. They have tremendous talent. They have tremendous resources, but they also have tremendous caseloads. And they may not have people dedicated solely to doing this sort of cell phone data uh, retrieval and analysis. And that's where the FBI is head and shoulders above everyone else because they've got the 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 people dedicated to this is all they do is, as as Bobby Chacon said the other day, this is their career. This is what they do. And so, therefore, um, you get them in and you use them and, and show them what you need to do. And they can go out and get that information for you like it's nobody's business. So thumbs up to the FBI uh, and also the OSBI for bringing in the FBI. It's a fantastic partnership. And it closed this case and figured every, everything out uh, in a very very brief period of time. And so we could all be thankful for that. Fantastic. This is yesterday that the defendants walking into the courtroom. We're seeing the four suspects charged in the double murder of two Kansas women, the four making a first appearance in court today. 
This just days after the bodies of the two women were discovered. Jacob, Jacob Albrock is joining us now with details from today's court appearance and reaction from outside the courthouse. Rachel, Mike, it's a case that's captivated many people in Kansas, Oklahoma, and around the country. Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly, both of Hugot in Kansas, disappeared late last month. Their bodies now found over the weekend in the Oklahoma panhandle. Today, suspects charged with their murder were in court for an arraignment as family and friends of the two women killed watched on. <laughs> Emotions running high as four suspects charged in the murder of two Kansas women appear in court for the first time. Can you tell me? Anything you say? So much anger, so much um, frustration. Tiffany Adams, Tad Collum, Cora and Cole Twombly, all charged with kidnapping and first-degree murder in the deaths of Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly. The two women vanished on March 30th. Investigators say Adams, who's the paternal grandmother of Butler's kids, was in a custody battle with Butler. Butler and Kelly were on their way from Kansas to pick up the children from Adams in Texas County, Oklahoma, when they disappeared. Their bodies were discovered this weekend in rural Texas County. How can you hate the mother of your grandchildren so much that you want to end her life? Family of the two women were in the courtroom for the arraignment as each suspect appeared. I hope justice is served and that everyone knows how amazing Veronica is. She is everything to this world and it sucks that she got taken away from us. She didn't deserve any of them, neither one of them did. Today, we learned that all four suspects were denied bond. The judge in the case says if convicted, all four could face death or life in prison without parole. Their next. So, you know, unbelievable. And the thing is, Mike, we, we got, as we started out this show, reporting that uh, Granny, <laughs> apparently Tiff <laughs> Tiffany Adams, is, as she does, uh, apparently hates to be called Granny, so we'll call her Granny. Granny confessed. Right. And that in itself is such powerful, power, powerful evidence, a confession after Miranda. And for you guys in the chat that don't know, when you watch Law and Order on TV, ad nauseum when they make an arrest, it makes me crazy. They always read Miranda on the scene. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right, blah, 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 blah. It's never done that way. But television loves that. They love Miranda. They love to do it out in the open. There's no cop, no detective would ever, ever do that. If they do, tell them Sergeant Bill said he's going to slap him in the back of the head. You don't do that. There's a reason that it's read privately uh, and so you can actually prove and you have the defendant sign off on it. So to read it in the street is just absolute theater. Right, Mike? Billy, yeah. it's been theater like that. I remember as a kid watching TV shows and it was always the dramatic moment on Hawaii Five O or something like that, Adam 12. You, as they're locking the person up, Murder one, you have the right to remain silent. No, 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 no. Maybe occasionally, a few times in the beginning, it was done that way. But no, everybody knows you bring them into the station house. You do it in a controlled environment. You do it quietly. You do it in their native language. You have them sign off on it that they understand. It's done in front of a desk sergeant or a squad sergeant. You know, this is all done to ensure that later on, that no one can say you didn't provide them with Miranda, with the Miranda warnings, because Miranda warnings are very important. Once the police read you your Miranda warnings, it is believed and it is assumed that if you are going to make statements that, are, that incriminate you and other people in a criminal action, that they are, that it's voluntary and that it's accurate. And so therefore, um, anyone trying to dis, um, you know, uh, fight against a Mirandized statement and say uh, it's inaccurate or was given uh, the statement, the statement was given and it wasn't given uh, voluntarily. No, it, the statement is assumed to be accurate and it's assumed to be voluntary. So therefore, yeah, yeah. The uh, Miranda is done very professionally. No one has to worry about that. You know, Mike, one of the other things, and this is a favorite of defense attorneys and good detectives know this. So they, when they present how Miranda was read. I read Miranda to, to say Tiffany Adams. It was at, uh, you know, let's say it was at 1500 hours on blah, blah, blah date. She was sitting in blah, blah, blah room. I asked if she would like uh, some water. 
uh, if, if she would need if she needed to use the ba bathroom, all those things to show that she had all her human needs being taken care of because defense attorneys will say, you didn't let her go to the bathroom. You didn't feed her for 22 hours. You made her sit in a hot room. So detectives know that defense attorneys will do that. So they document all of that. Your client was given a 22-ounce glass of water. She, I asked her what she would like to eat. We bought her a cheeseburger and French fries from blah, 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 blah. Here's a copy of the receipt. She ate it and you know, had such a, you know, so all of that stuff is memorialized on what's known mm -hmm. as a complaint follow-up in NYPD jargon, a DD5. Right. So a defense attorney, when he starts going through that nonsense in court, the detective can be called up on the stand by the prosecution. The detective could say, I'm going to read my complaint follow-up. Your client ate at this hour, had access to water. I even let her smoke a cigarette, which is not allowed inside. But, you know, when someone's going to confess to a homicide, they want to smoke a cigarette, you let them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, you know, the, the defense attorneys, well, that's their job, to zealously advocate for their client. But, you know, in the end, even they know that they, they've gotten the case file. They've gotten... Well, a lot, you know, all of that information, you know, by the time they get to a pretrial hearing, they they know it's probably not going to work. But, you know, you got to try the tricks anyway. You just never know. But, yeah, police are are very, very professional. People don't have to worry about that. They know what they're doing. They're working with other agencies like the FBI. Um, it's not maybe how it might have been 50 years ago or something like that. No. Now, this is all done very professionally. And with the with the technological advances like in cell phone and GPS, um, it really makes uh, the job of the detective that much better because they are can be more assured of, of what they're doing, what they're thinking that happened. They can put it together a lot better. There's much more information uh, in at their fingertips. It's expensive. It's time consuming, but they give the detectives and the police much more information and that and that's assuring to everybody that there's no you know mistake in terms of someone who is innocent you know being caught up in some sort of conspiracy like this you know with all that data you know exactly who was where and when and possibly who they were with and what they were doing so it's thumbs up to all the law enforcement in this case all around very good job 100 percent unleashed from the chat the 60-year-old provided quick info and thorough detail. She is extremely important here. I'm not disagreeing. I just think these dumb criminals would have eventually been caught regardless. You know, Unleashed, you take all the evidence you can get in a case like this. This is icing on the cake. The 16-year-old complaining witness that she was named as in the affidavit, she's extremely important because she gave the picture of what actually happened from the mouths of the perps from the mouths of Cora, <laughs> of Cora and Cole Earl Twombly. Someone said, I sound like I have a speech defect when I say Twombly. <laughs> it is a little bit of a hard word, hard last name to say, Twombly. It's a weird last name, sort of. Can you say that, Mike, without having a speech defect? Uh, tw yeah, yeah, tw Twombly, <laughs> I guess. But, you know, that girl is fantastic. They probably would have solved this case anyway. But having her talk to the police in such a candid manner gives them such inside information that they may never have gotten from anyone else. So, yeah, they probably would have been able to solve the case anyway, but it really makes the prosecution of them in, at a future date much more uh, assured. So uh, fantastic job by that 16-year-old. Dilly Pickles, great screen name. Uh, police off the cuff. No, it was towards the beginning. But for those who don't know, Stephen Jones, the attorney, was Timothy McVeigh's attorney, state appointed. Wow. Oh, I didn't That's know. a little bit of trivia. Uh, I don't know if it'll come into play here. Uh, first one to roll gets a prize. Pat Edwards, you know something? Mm -hmm. We predicted that one of the weaker links, in fact, Mike predicted, and I'm going to say the last name, which I have a speech defect <laughs> saying, he predicted Cora Twombly would flip because she'd be the weakest link. But guess who flips? The strongest, the one who was the most culpable, the, the shooter. Or uh, We don't know for sure, but it appears that she was the shooter. 
So the shooter confesses, and I don't know if the other, did the others make statements? Maybe, maybe they did too. Maybe this is wrapped up with a, a box with a nice, neat red bow. I don't know. But they may have made statements also, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, Billy, I made that 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 prediction. I bet a paycheck. But I'm I'd rather I'm glad I lost that paycheck. I'm glad I lost my shirt on that prediction because that uh that 16 year old statement comes out of left field and I'm really happy for it. So I'll gladly give up that paycheck. I'm hoping that somewhere along the line that they the defense attorney for um you know the couple ta- uh, uh Cole and Cora to twab twablies, I hope that attorney speaks to them and says, look, you know, maybe Maybe, you know, we can get you a deal because really who do the, you know, who actually started all this? And that's grandma. You know, you, if you do, if you speak, you may get life with possibility of parole in 25 years for your part. Maybe, maybe, you know, again, it also depends on the forensic evidence. If it turns out that, that uh, Cora and her uh, boyfriend actually did the shooting or the beatings, well, that's probably not going to be that sort of offer, but I'm hoping that if if uh, they didn't actually do the do the actual killing themselves, um, that uh, that they would be given an offer and turn because then that would give you not only the you, what you have with the 16 year old, which is the surrounding circumstances before and afterwards, but if you have one of them, uh, the twobly speak, you get the actual inside information of what actually happened during the killings of these two beautiful people. Southern Red, where is Grice? That's my question. Well, question. Paul Good Grice question. is named in the arrest affidavit. So maybe he took off. Maybe he beat it out of town and they're looking for him. But as during this entire investigation, the OSBI and the FBI have been zipped. They have zipped it. They are not offering that up. Could he have fled the jurisdiction based on the arrest affidavit? He's in the trick bag. He's one of the perpetrators here and probably will be arrested down the road. Maybe he took off. Maybe he's in the wind, as we say in New York. Yeah, Billy, he's probably beat it someplace as far as he can go, as quick as he can go. Um, he may have friends in the area where, he, where they can hide him. But uh, if there's a reward offered or you, somebody just spots him because – yeah, uh, I don't think he'll stay in that area because everybody knows everybody in that area, and you can't blend in. I think he'll go someplace else. But uh, if uh, if just you, if they can get a, a picture of him, if they can find something online that they could note, and this is where you use the press to notify the public. Look at this picture. If you see this person, you know there's a reward out for you. There's a fifty thousand dollar reward for the arrest and conviction of this person. Um, you can incentivize people and incentivize the press to work with you and, and catch this guy. But I'm sure he's he's beat it, I'm sure. Sharon Lane, please know that Oklahomans, rural Oklahomans, Republicans, and Christians don't support or cover up this crazy, evil woman. Sharon Lane, we do not even remotely mean to imply that. This crime is 100% to do with these four people, perhaps additional people, but we in no way mean to implicate or disparage Oklahomans who are great people and hardworking Americans. And we do not mean, but we're just, we're always suspicious. So the more people we see involved in this, we more people we think could be involved in this. And there is, you know, we know from working in New York city that powerful people get second and third chances and powerful people can influence other powerful people that can decide the fate of other powerful people. And that's just a fact in this world, you know, whether you're wealthy or you're a politician, you're influential, the law doesn't apply the same way to you. It's just a, it's just an absolute fact to that. Nora, can the family courts and child protective services remove the children from Wrangler's care? Kids have two sets of grandparents. I heard Veronica's dad lives in West Virginia with his partner. Nora, there has to be cause. There has to be reason. They can't just say based on rumor or conjecture, or based on this, he's not involved in this so far. If the investigators determine that he is involved in this, then absolutely. The child services, child welfare, they can remove the kids from his care, from his custody, from his legal right to have custody. Mike. Yeah, Billy, I, I would imagine Oklahoma is very similar to New York, where 
you know, the, the nuclear family as, as whatever is of a nuclear family is the best place for a child uh, or children. And if there is actually no, um, um, any sort of legal, um, charges against this guy, uh, um, to, uh, what's his name? Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Wrangler. I can't, I couldn't think of that, his first name. Wrangler. If there's no actual charge against Wrangler, he may be in a position to assert his uh, paternity rights to his, to his custody of his children. Um, and so it may seem rather strange and uh, we don't know how, what level of guilt or innocence he has, but if he's not being charged, he probably, if he wants, he will get, be able to get custody of those children. I would think if it's in New York, you definitely get custody of those children. I'm thinking Oklahoma's the same thing that he would, if he wanted, get custody of those children. 100%. Karen L., so you confirming the feds can track us at will? You know, Karen, before I answer that, I can confirm that Amazon, Facebook, um, Google, YouTube, any of these um, content creating, you know, any of these digital organizations can can track you at will you ever been talking on the phone about something all of a sudden you receive a commercial on that same topic you were talking about what do you think's happening do you think they're tracking and listening to you you bet they are but guess what you gave up your freedom just like i did you gave up well i'm not your freedom your privacy i'll put it that way you right. gave up your privacy through having that thing we all have on our damn hand all the time a cell phone you gave up your privacy by ordering things online because that's the most convenient way to do it. I do it. You do it. Guess what? They know where you live, don't they? You don't, When you go on Amazon, you don't even have to put your car, two numbers in and they have your whole card, don't they? So to answer your question now, so am I confirming the feds can track us at will? Yeah, they can, but they have one little hurdle. If they want to track your phone, they have to get a search warrant, right? Amazon doesn't. Facebook doesn't. Facebook is one of the dirtiest companies there is. They track everything about you. And, you know, if you ever saw, I don't want to get into it, it gets political after a while. You see some of these guys testify before Congress. It's actually embarrassing how they invade your privacy. So, yes, the FBI can track you, but so can the private sector, Mike. Yeah, basically, if people are worried about their privacy online, they're worried about their privacy online from commercial companies like, you know, Barnes Noble, Google, and all these other, uh, any, any, any and every company out there wants to sell you something. How can they get it to, it to your attention as fast as possible? And that's through all of your purchases. If you purchase a book on, on, on uh, say Barnes Noble and, you know, or, or you purchase a dress or you purchase something on Amazon, they know after a while, a pattern of what, of what you're, you like in terms of commercial products. So they can put together, can figure out, Pretty much maybe how old you are, what your gender is, uh, maybe perhaps even your income level. And they can make pretty good guesses about, you know, that sort of thing and direct products to you. Um, the government isn't really going to be interested in spying on you. They have the capability, but they're not going to do it unless you present some sort of, you know, evidence of criminal activity. And they're asked to. And as Billy said, all they need is a, is a search warrant. And they can get that pretty quickly and they can have access even greater than uh, commercial companies. But yeah, we've given up our privacy. Uh, I do this all the time too. I buy things online, on desktop, on my uh, on my phone. And we've just kind of slid into that uh, idea uh, and of convenience and we give up our time, we give up our uh, privacy. We certainly do. You know, I ask some of you people out there, how many people have Venmo? How many people have PayPal? How many people have electronic? I, yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Is that giving up your privacy? You bet it is, because mm -hmm. guess who's tracking that? The IRS mm -hmm. is tracking that to right. see how much money you receive from Venmo, see how much money you receive from PayPal. PayPal already taxes you. <laughs> they take money out of it right away. So don't worry about the FBI as much as you should worry about these private sector people that are directly plugged into our government. Tory 3, I didn't read anywhere that they planned – the anvil from an overpass. We're going to find. Uh, well, it's they. It's in the arrest affidavit that they wanted to throw an anvil through her windshield. How else? Well, maybe we assumed that it was going to be thrown off an overpass. How else could you throw an anvil that weighs 150 to 200 pounds through someone's windshield? It's not like you could pick it up and toss it through someone's windshield. 
it's way too heavy. Uh, just the whole idea of it seems crazy to me anyway. Like, uh, just doesn't seem feasible. Um, yeah, someone's saying like the coyote, that's the, from the uh, one law, 214. According to Kansas local news, Jillian's clip was still in the car, but her gun not found. Granny and goons even had kitty litter, which was apparent on the scene, soaking up huge amounts of blood. Apparently, Jillian's clip was found inside her purse, which was found on the scene. Uh, the gun, they probably took the gun, you know, because she was known to carry a gun. And perhaps she didn't see the danger coming quickly enough that she was able to draw and uh, take care of business with these people. But uh, I want to play a little of Banfield yesterday. This gives a, a from yesterday's court appearances. News Nation's national correspondent Brian Enton was right there, front row, actually, for all of it. He joins me now live. Brian, you've had a hell of a day. Um, I know that you expected it would be tense in that courtroom, but I'm sure you did not expect how intense it was going to be. And start from the beginning when you arrived and saw snipers on the roof. Yeah, so this was a unique court experience. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it in Texas County, Oklahoma, a small courthouse. We show up and I immediately notice that there's sheriff's deputies everywhere, snipers up on the roof of the courthouse for security. Uh, there is a police drone in the air, actually, that they're flying over the small parking lot. They've got deputies out in the parking lot with those um, metal detector wands. And before you could go into the courthouse, right in the parking lot in the middle, you had to spread your arms. They checked you, obviously no electronics, no cell phones. I was wearing a hoodie. I couldn't even wear my hoodie. They said, you have to take your hoodie off and take it back to the car. I've never had that happen before. So finally get inside, we go up to the third floor, small little quaint courthouse, very, very small courtroom. Uh, and that's when uh, sort of the emotions just exploded, Ashley. Okay, so now um, walk me through, again, a small courtroom and four defendants. Normally, you've got one defendant, and it's hard to fit people in a courtroom when it's a big media circus. But you guys, the media, were given the front row, which is very strange. We're usually pushed at least halfway back or to the back. Why were you all in the front row? Yeah, so small courtroom. And the first thing I wondered was, this is interesting. I've never been allowed to sit in the front row before. I later realized it was actually a very good move by the court administration. So we sit down. They brought the suspects in one by one. So they didn't bring them all in at the same time. And they marched them right through the middle of this little courthouse, by the way. You saw they come out the front door, the video you're looking at. So there's no, like, back hallway or anything like that. So that was interesting. Uh, and they bring them in one by one. And there's about two dozen family members of the victims in the back two rows. And it is just... Um, another level of emotion, sobbing, crying. And then when each person came in, they, were, they, they weren't they were yelling, but they were talking loudly enough for everyone to hear and directing things at the suspects during the court hearing. I've never seen it before. And I wrote down some of the things they said. When Cole Trumbly came in, uh, Veronica's dad said, bastard, bastard. Uh, when uh, Tad Cullum came in, uh, they said, um, you are a sorry, uh, ass piece of, uh, you know what, I'm not going to say what they said, a, a bad word. Um, and when Grandma Tiffany came in, they said, effing B word who killed my daughter. And this is while the others are sobbing. And then at one point, not at one point, pretty much throughout the entire thing, it took about an hour for them to get through each one of the suspects. Uh, they had to hold Veronica's dad back. And it was his, his family members were literally holding on to each arm because he wanted to rush the suspects. And uh, I guess it was just, I've never seen it before because normally when, you know, when people get emotional in a courtroom, they will stop, the bailiff will say, everybody, we understand this is emotional, but, you know, please, that didn't happen here. It just moved on. I got to be honest with you. I feel like I would have done the same. I know courtroom protocol. Yeah. I know decorum, but I'm not so sure I could have held back. I think someone would have had to hold me back if someone had done that to my child. Um, it is interesting, though, that you say nothing um, stopped them. Like, the judge didn't say, order in the court, order in the court, bailiffs, please get the, you know, gallery under control. There was, there was no attempt to, to sort of quell that, those actions. No, I will say the deputies sort of gathered around that area uh, where the victim's families were. So they were ready. I mean, if he was, if, if he was to get away from them holding him. Um, but again, I think the judge felt it, too. I mean, 
you just felt so deeply for these families, Ashley. The emotion, the sadness, um, I can't even really explain it. You could see it in their faces, just how distraught they were. So maybe that's why the judge just sort of let it carry on. I mean, it was just, it was hard not to just feel bad for them. I mean, just so heartbreaking in every respect. So, and, and also perplexing, just perplexing. So the, the um, you said the dad, Veronica's dad lunged at the defendants and uh, his sister, which would be Veronica's aunt, held him back. You met both of them, Veronica's dad and Veronica's aunt, outside the, the courthouse. Um, what'd they say to you? Yeah, so this sort of strange scene continued outside the courthouse because they basically kept everybody seated and then they bring the suspects right out through the middle of the small courthouse, right out the front door, through the parking lot, the video you're looking at, they came in, they went out, and there was a crowd of people out there, local people watching, and there were also uh, family members of the suspect out there. Uh, there was, um, it was Tad's sister, I wrote down what, what she said. She said uh, that uh, he would never hurt a woman. She was screaming that outside while all of this was happening. Uh, and then the victim's families came out and I spoke with Veronica's dad and aunt. Again, just feel terrible for them. Thank you for watching. Yeah, you know, it, it, this, it's sort of a great uh, report because you get a feel of uh, what it was like in a courtroom, what it was like when the people um, showed up. Someone in the chat, before I, I, I forget, they said, what if someone starts confessing to you on the scene? Okay, I, you guys ask good questions. No, then good. I would, once probable cause was established, I would read Miranda right, right there. Yeah, I would. That's a, a, like sort of an exception. If the person starts spewing forth, I did it, and this is how I did it. I'm not gonna say, all right, wait, you know, wait till we get back to the station house. I would try to put the person in a in a location where we could talk privately and then read a Miranda, but I would not do it out in the open on the scene. Yes, you're right. If someone starts confessing right there, I can't say, Oh, don't do that yet, you know. But I've had cases where I've picked up a murderer in the Bronx and brought him back to Manhattan, and me and two detectives didn't say a word to the guy until we got back, in this uh, instance, to the 2-3 squad in Spanish Harlem because we didn't want to do the interview in the car because it's not conducive. You're moving, you're driving, you're, and there's distractions. We wanted to wait till we got him back to the 2-3 squad and interviewed him right there. So I just thought, I don't want to, you know, I could, we could get really get into this and uh, there's all kinds of different what have shoulda, coulda, but... Um, that's 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 the that's why we wouldn't we don't read Miranda right out in the open on the scene, Mike. Yeah, you uh, want you Miranda to be done under very controlled circumstances, and you want everyone to be calm, and you want to do it properly. Um, but like you say, if somebody is saying something spontaneously out in the public, and you know, as you get on, on a scene, um, you don't have to turn your ears off. You could take all that information, and you could put on a report you know, later on and you can use that. And then you get, that can help you then later on formulate questions when you actually, uh, you know, read Miranda to them. But, it, you know, that doesn't happen too often. People are pretty cagey about that. They're pretty smart about that. But even when you read them, Miranda warnings in the, in a very controlled environment in a, in a detective squad room, um, probably statistically, statistically anyway, about three quarters of all defendants, uh, waive their their rights under Miranda um, and actually speak to uh, speak to the cops, trying to you know tell them a tale or whatever to make them look themselves look good or something like that or justify what they're doing. But yeah, uh, Miranda has been around with us for now sixty uh, oh I don't know sixty uh, couple of, you know sixty something years. So therefore, um, everybody knows it. Everybody understands it. It's part of our you know criminal justice system. It's not new. Uh, the, the perps know it and um, it's done very properly because you don't ever want to make like a technical mistake with uh, a suspect and perhaps have incriminate, excellent, useful, incriminating statements thrown out. 100%. You know, Mike, everyone is asking about this judge. Did he get fired? Did he resign? I'm going to just play this. This is Brian Enton speaking about the judge. And Brian Enton sort of had an involvement in this. His interview with this judge is what got the judge put into hot water, but the judge didn't really use good judge mint. 
uh, the city council forced me to resign. They were so unhappy that I spoke out about all of this. I just went back to the judge's house uh, to find out what happened. Take a listen. I was sitting here in the house and I got a phone call. There was a city council meeting last night and they said, you need to come over here. So I went over there. It's only a block. I walked over and uh, I went in and they were in executive session. Uh, when it was over, three or four minutes, they called me in and down. They said, uh, we've had a lot of static about your interview. And we don't like it. The mayor has absolute control over my job. I'm appointed. He can hire me or fire me. And I said, well, just fire me. One of the councilmen popped up and said, oh, you're going to turn in your resignation. He's very nasty about it. I, I didn't appreciate that. And I said, that's not a problem. I'll quit. You remember, Elizabeth, he talked to us yesterday about the cult group God's Misfits, what he had heard about them, also the fact that he knew the suspect, and apparently they weren't happy he was talking about it. It just goes to show why everyone is so nervous to talk around here. There's intimidation. The suspects were powerful. They owned thousands of acres of land. Um, you know, you look at their pictures, you might not realize it, but they were powerful, mm -hmm. influential people in this area, Elizabeth. Yeah, and all along we've been reporting, even before they made the arrests, before we discovered the bodies, there was a lot of fear around this grandmother. Uh, people just were very afraid to speak out about this family. I guess we're seeing now a little evidence of that. Thanks. So, so you know, people want to ask, well, why did the judge get fired? And, you know, you can agree with it, disagree with it. The judge used horrendous judgment. A guy gets arrested for murder first degree. His friend, Tad Burt Cullum, who's Granny's boyfriend. And he says, oh, he's a great friend of mine. I can't believe he would have. Dude, maybe you should shut up. You're a judge, you know, use judgment. That was very poor judgment for you to say a guy who's just been arrested for murder first degree is a great friend of yours and he would never do it. Now, I don't, it, they didn't identify I believe this judge is a civil judge, so I don't think he had anything to do with any of the cases affecting these people. But it's just its just like we as police officers, one of the things we know is that we're not allowed to associate with known criminals off-duty anywhere. And if you do do that, you can get fired. So this was sort of the equivalent of that. All right, maybe you love Tad. Maybe he's your homeboy. But guess what? He just got arrested for murder the first degree, so shut your mouth. <laughs> yeah, Billy, you know, he probably it was a town judge, and maybe he did, uh, you know, uh, traffic summonses and maybe complaints about uh, noise levels of parties and maybe some zoning questions and deciding some zoning cases. But he, did, he was not a criminal court judge that worked for a county that would have the uh, authority to sign like a, a arrest warrant or a search warrant, or have anything to do with this case whatsoever. So that's the good news, you know. And I'm glad he he resigned because um, anyone who would say, you know, oh yeah, I'm, and you, there's nothing wrong with saying, oh my god, I knew that person. I'm so shocked that that happened. But then he said, you know, uh, he said he made it. He was like, yo, he's still my friend, um, and. You know, I understand what he means. Like he hasn't been actually found guilty yet, but why on earth would you do that? Um, I think you would want to, uh, as, as a as a human being, say, you know, I, I that he should have just said, I I've known that. He should tell Brian Hinton, yeah, I know of him. He's he's been a long time resident. I'm a long time resident. I really can't speak about it. That would have been the smartest thing to do, and just say hello, Mr. Hinton, and just walk away. But no, he sticks his foot in his mouth. He sounded like a jerk, and he deserved. I'm sorry, he deserved what he got. You know, Mike. Also, and Alex Bird is uh, is uh, reminding us that he was with Tad Bird Cullum when the police raided his house. That's he right. That's actually right. That's 100 percent right. He was talking about, oh, I was scared. I'm a Vietnam veteran. They had rifles pointed at my face and all this other stuff. Dude, you got to pick your friends better. You know, right? You can't be hanging. And he's in business with Tad Cullum, so. That's why, you know, if you're a judge, uh, perhaps, you know, you should keep your mouth shut, not talk about uh, this guy who's just been arrested for murder, first degree, kidnapping, first degree, and uh, conspiracy to commit murder. Maybe it's 
it's, this is the day you keep your mouth shut and you don't go bragging about it on national television, right? Uh, exactly. One law, 214, he's despicable for comparing of his NAM experience in a war to two innocent women having guns stuck in their face. One law, I, I agree with you. I just think he probably used the Vietnam thing to solicit sort of sympathy to who he is and all of that stuff. Donna Lynn Marshall, I heard that they probably shot Gillian and tortured and beat the hell out of Veronica. I heard that assumption on TST Nation. It's absolutely disturbing, all of it. I don't know where they have that information. I would never report that unless I know it for a fact, unless I have uh, documented evidence that that in fact occurred. Someone else reported it, and it's a. Uh, I, I don't think that's a good thing to put out there unless it's 100% true. Lacey Peterson gave to victims' families so kids are safe emotionally and physically. Should not have said that of WL. Look at assaults and weapon charges. Numbers can look up. Veronica was in high school. God, I'm not sure where you're going with that. The judge in Tad, per his words, said they saw each other pretty much every morning for the past 30 days. I'd like to know where judge was the morning of March 30th. Good point. Well, all of this will be investigated. They will, you know, they're taking a deep, deep dive into this. And this investigation is not over. Uh, can other, will other people perhaps get, get arrested? Mary Williams, these people thought they were protecting the kids. They let their emotions get in the way. Good people do bad things. Bad people do good things. True. Yeah, but you know something? You can't even say that because murder isn't the solution to trying to protect kids. So you murder someone else. It's like the old expression, two wrongs don't make a right. And this is a huge wrong. It's a, a killing someone, you know. Thou shalt not kill is one of the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, and not that I'm the most religious person, but I do remember that from my religious studies that, and my years in homicide. Thou shalt not kill. So these four people, or maybe more, maybe five people conspired to kill. And they killed, you know, you could say uh, Veronica was involved in this whole dispute, but Jillian Kelly had nothing to do with it. And just because she worked for Veronica, you kill her too? That's real cold, don't you think, Mike? Yeah, Billy. Um, there's, there's. Um, I mean, I understand what, what the uh, viewer is saying. You know, good people, people who are good can do wrong, dumb things every once in a while. And, and some people who are, are basically bad can occasionally do something good. But yeah, this goes far beyond that. This is just absolute cold-blooded killing with absolutely no remorse whatsoever. Um, and I think, and someone had mentioned in the chat just a second ago about the 16-year-old. Could she be considered an accessory to the crime after the fact? Um, technically, yes, because if she actually helped clean up and destroy physical evidence, she could be. But because she was 16 years old and, um, you know, and she's a child and that she made spontaneous statements uh, that helped the investigation, um, I, I think nobody's going to going to worry about that whatsoever. Um, she, uh, she I, I admire that that 16 year old. The judge, on the other hand, I would like to see where his cell phone has been and, you know, where it was between uh, uh, March 30th and just the other day when everyone was arrested. I would really like to see uh, track that cell phone. Yeah, 100 percent. Someone in the chat said, oh, my mocking his service to his country. Absolutely no. not. No, he used that to try to get out of the stupid thing he did. Right. So, exactly. yes, we we salute you for your service to your country. But don't use that to try to get out of something stupid that you just did. It's like me saying doing something really stupid and then saying, oh, I was a cop for 27 years. I served this. I did that. I'm a 9-11 for I shouldn't be doing that. If I do something stupid, I better own up to it, not hide and pull out my, you know, my service to, to the NYPD for 27 years to get out of doing something stupid. I would never do that. And neither should this judge. I want to play this of the local police chief here. Do you guys know exactly what we're dealing with? Neither do we. All right. So we're going to take those extra precautions. The affidavit claims the suspects were in an anti-government group called God's Misfits. Additional members are unclear, but one of them is not a man called Squirrel, who runs a website called God's Misfits out of South Carolina. It's amazing how your life can change in just a, <laughs> just a split second. You not have 
anything to do with it at all. He says his God's Misfits is a small ministry he runs with his wife, but now he's just trying to exonerate himself from internet users from around the world. What Marco is from United Kingdom, and he, he he's a, I guess it, they call him a troll. And so I'm like, you don't even have a dog in the fight, dude. Why are you trying to spread hate toward me? He said he just wants to spread love of Jesus and that the last thing he wants is to be associated with the devil's work. The affidavit says the suspects bought burner phones found near the crime scene and tasers as well. It also states the children's father was in rehab at the time of the women's disappearance. So, you know, you could see the local people were asking why there were snipers on the roof because they didn't know what they were dealing with. You know, why you saw the, the response to the search warrants, they were loaded for bear. There was like 50 cars that responded to do the search warrants, which incidentally, the judge was there when Tad was, search warrant was served. When they enforced the search warrant, the arrest warrant against him, the judge was there. So, you know, look, poor judgment. That's all I'll say, Mike. Yeah, Billy, um, I think, you know, the, uh, the court officers did a fabulous job. Um, there could have been a riot there. I think having, you know, uh, a couple of sharpshooters, snipers on the roof could intimidate either the uh, victims' families from taking action in their own hands or from the uh, families of the and relatives of the perpetrators taking matters in their own hands. Uh, from what I saw on the video and from what I heard with Brian Hinton, they did an excellent job trying to do, you know, make the best of a very volatile situation. And they, they, my thumbs up to them, too, because that cannot be easy in that situation. That's got to be a very difficult, very diff uh, and dangerous job. You know, Mike, from day one on this case and for the two weeks till they made the arrest, law enforcement did an unbelievable job on it. Give my thumbs up to them. Oh, yeah. OSBI, the FBI, the Kansas Highway Patrol, the Oklahoma Highway Patrol, the Kansas police that were right on this scene. They did it. And, and you know what? Another thing they did a great job of keeping their mouths shut. Not an easy thing to do because too many people know that's too many people, you know, you tell someone and then, you know, they can exercise their mouth and tell someone that shouldn't have a right to know. And that's how rumors start. I'm going to play this last clip. And uh, in towns, all driving miles just to come to the court hearing today. Many of them telling me they just wanted to support the victims. <laughs> <laughs> to show the family our support. There's not much we can do. But as a community, we can come together and rally around the families right now. And I mean, you go to the store and people are talking about it. Communities rallying together Wednesday in support of two Kansas women who lost their lives in the Oklahoma panhandle. Outside the courthouse, dozens of people lined up also in support. It's consumed my life. Um, I'm just glad that the people that need to be caught got caught. The sheriff of Texas County telling me how tight-knit the community is and how the tragedy has affected everyone. This is, this is a tough deal, all right? We're not just police officers that go out and arrest people. We have feelings, too. The state, while reading off these four suspects' charges, said they lured Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly to Highway 95 and Road L before committing heinous crimes. Veronica's family emotional hearing it read four different times. It was just very nerve wracking. It was, um, you know, it was just everything to keep my brother in his seat, you know. Saying the two didn't deserve this and hopefully justice will be served. We had lost a beautiful, beautiful young lady that would do anything for anybody. <laughs> Stuff that movies are made of, it's not. <laughs> This shouldn't be our life. <laughs> and their next scheduled court appearance is May 15th at 9 a.m. Reporting in Guyman, Megan Mosley, KOCO 5 News. So as you could see, folks, uh, this has affected this community tremendously. Family members, think of how many people are affected by these two murders. Uh, the husband of uh, Jillian Kelly is a pastor at a church. She has four kids of her own. You know, 
talk about someone innocent of doing anything wrong here. I mean, not that not that, that Veronica did anything wrong either, but needless, like, why did they have to kill Jillian too? You know, that just made no sense, makes no sense at all. Uh, you know, we're going to keep covering this case as it moves along because I think there's a good possibility that could be more arrests in this case. And as the case moves on, we'll be finding out more and more of the investigative details, things that we don't know right now. I see a lot of brand new people in the chat. And folks, again, if you're not subscribed to us as Police Off the Cuff Real Crime Stories, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell, it's, uh, give us a thumbs up, hit the like button. It's free to do that. Join the Police Off the Cuff YouTube family. We'd be thrilled to have you with us. Mike, your final thoughts. Final thoughts, Kelly. Really looking at that, uh, the video of the families outside and of uh, the Kelly family and the Butler family, you know, my heart goes out to them. And unfortunately, as much as you would pray for them, there's really nothing you could say for solace to give to that family. They are suffering with this so intently. My heart goes out to them. I'll pray for them for, for what good it can do. But they, they deserve all of our privacy, all of our respect and you know, and just keep them in our prayers because they are victims too. those mother and father and sisters and brothers and, you know, other family members, they are suffering right along. And uh, so just keep, keep them in our prayers. Well said, Mike, uh, absolutely well said. And uh, again, we, when we cover these cases, it's almost like you feel the same sort of empathy and the same sort of, uh, feelings of being upset at a real homicide case that you actually worked on. At least I feel that way. Oh yeah. And these cases bring you back into this that feelings that you thought that uh, you wouldn't maybe ever feel again, but uh, we want to appreciate again, all the work that law enforcement did and will continue to do. They've done a fantastic job. We pray for the families and the friends of the people that lost their lives and the people of this town in, in Oklahoma, I'm sure they're great people. And this sort of turns your town upside down. Uh, again, folks, thank you for tuning in today. I'm Bill Cannon from Police Off the Cuff Real Crime Stories. Have a great day, everyone, and God bless. God bless. One episode, just ain't enough.